This is part two of an interview conducted with Catherine Marquis, former, former oral history librarian and of and as of July 1st, Professor Emerita of Library Science. It will cover her position as databases librarian from 1975 to 1996, and then her responsibilities as a faculty member in the Virginia Kelly Carnes Archives and Special Collections Research Center, formerly known as the Archives and Special Collections. It takes place on August 5, 2011 in Stewart Center at Purdue University. The interviewer is Stephanie Schmitz. Welcome, Katie. Thank you very much. So for 21 years, you were a databases librarian. That's right. Yeah. Involved with computer-based information services. Right. Can you talk about how you got started with that? The service itself started in 1975. Uh, the dean of pharmacy and the vet school <clears throat> met with our then director of the libraries, Joseph Dagnese because some of their users had been using the National Library of Medicine database, Medline, but they had to either access it directly by means of a request to the National Library of Medicine. And what they would get back would be punch cards and then they'd have to look at, at them and see if these were references that they wanted. The uh, IU Medical Center, had a, a, their library was providing it, but for the doctors and the physicians there. So one thing led to another, and it was decided that uh, the library would move ahead and provide this service with the National Library of Medicine's Medline database. So there was a search that went on, and when the decision was made, I was offered the position. I was already on board in the library and, and, and had been doing personnel before that. So when uh, they decided to move ahead with it, as I said, and then the position was open, and when this was made, I was, I was offered the position of the Medline Analyst. Also along with that was that there was a period of training, and so I was sent by the library to the National Library of Medicine for three weeks of very intensive training, and it was wonderful. <clears throat> you learned how they did the indexing, you learned how they, the computers that they were using, which were mainframe, and you really got to interact with a lot of the people who also managed the service desk there. So when I came back after three weeks, I got to a small, I've had several offices, but I had an office with two other people at that time, and then we got started. The equipment that we used in, in those days, we bought a portable computer, and it was a dial-up access so that you had to use a, a phone in the, to plug in the back like rabbit ears. And then from that telephone connection, which was a, a closed line, it was not a party line or anything of that sort, then you would be able to access the Medline database. And that's the National Library of Medicine is the one that we got started with first. Once the thing was up and running, uh, the first thing I did was to try to introduce it to our faculty, to the library faculty. So I went around and did some demonstrations. And then I also started with some of the departments, certainly with the vet school and the pharmacy school, to tell them a little bit about it and that the service was available. <clears throat> the service was a fee-based service. Now, we, it was a, not a uh, cost recovery at all, but just to meet the charges that were incurred from using the databases of the vendors. So uh, that, and then we had to set up, we didn't have any kind of forms, so I set those forms up, uh, and also the search request forms. What departments made use of that service? The Initially, most? it was the vet school and the pharmacy school, but then we also had some people in the foods and nutrition over in the consumer and family sciences. And then as, as we went on, uh, we, we picked up other vendors. We, the next one that we went with was Dialog. Now, Dialog was, was a very large uh, operation, and they were located in California. They had access to a lot of, the, a lot of databases. One of the things that goes along with this is that you need to keep you need to go to training sessions, and so I would be going to some dialogue sessions, and then they would show me how the database would be searched and things of that sort, and they also had very good. All of the vendors that we dealt with had excellent customer support, and if you had a problem and you needed some help, you could touch base with them. I also, over the years, got a smaller portable computer, uh, again with the dial-up access, and I would take that around uh, before the vet school had somebody doing searching, I would usually go down there one day a week and talk to the faculty and then take their requests and then bring them back to the library and, and uh, run the searches for them. What you got was a printout, okay? 
and uh, sometimes the people would come and work with me, but sometimes they would give me a call over the telephone, and then I would work out the strategy with them. And vet and pharmacy, those are pretty obscure subjects when you're database searching. So how did you get to know the literature and, and what were good keywords? I think that keeping track of with it by the newsletters, also doing the searches themselves and working with the people one-on-one, -on -one, they were very, very helpful to me and explained exactly some of the keywords. They would give me some keywords. And then I also had a lot of search guides. I, had, I knew that the National Library of Medicine had a very controlled vocabulary, their thesaurus, and I had to use that. I would use that for the keywords. It wasn't, pre, it wasn't pre text searching. So you really had to have a feel for it. And then with Medline, with the National Library of Medicine, that provided access to their other databases, such as ToxLine. We had CancerLine and a number of the databases that the National Library of Medicine made available. And I'm sure you made a, a lot of impact in a lot of professors' areas of research. And I'm just wondering, were you a faculty, were you considered a faculty member back then? Absolutely. And I always was when I was, when I was, when I was hired in 1968, it was an, at the instructor rank with the rank of, and then over it, within a couple of years, the status changed so that it was a full faculty uh, with including sabbaticals and promotion and tenure and they don't have the instructor rank anymore. Okay. And when you were a fa or being a faculty member back then, do you feel like that had any bearing on how they viewed you or how you did your work? I don't think so, no. I think that the fact that the library was providing the service and we were one of the only, the only other uh, place in the, in the uh, system was also the Net Health at IU Med Center and also Lilly. But it was really unique, and then over time, one of the people at one of the regional campuses also decided to offer them. One of the things that we did is we added more vendors, such as SDC and BRS, and we had access at one time, including Dow Jones, all of them, uh, all of the big ones, including one in, the, in Britain. But over time, each, in each of many of the school libraries, the departmental libraries, such as Life Science, uh, the vet school, uh, also in the pharmacy, they had people in, in the Hissey Library, people that also could do the online searching. And they would, they would have training sessions, we'd have sessions in Indianapolis, and then we would go down there for those. And then also, if I went to some of the meetings of the vendor, what I learned there and when I came back, I would share that with the people that were also doing searching. Engineering was doing quite a bit of searching. The chemistry library, John Pinzalek did a lot of searching in that area. Now this is going to be a tricky one. Do you remember any of the wackiest things that they wanted you to search or any of the trickiest questions that you ever had? Well, I think in response to that, the library also appropriated some money for reference. If you had some reference questions and sometimes we would use that and then they knew that the databases so and the other librarians could also handle that and then what they used to do is send their charges to me and then I would take care of them mm -hmm. you know so that was nice and one of the other things is that the it used to be the HISI li uh, the uh, Humanities Social Science and Education School the Dean appropriated some money for faculty or uh, to uh, have computer literature searches done. And each year we would have that, and so that if it was okay for them to do it, they would bring the slip and then we would run the search for them. And that was very helpful. In fact, the dean, uh, and then when he moved to the grad school and also to become the provost and vice president, Robert Ringel, over time I still did searches for him even when he was over in the provost and vice president. So I used to, he, I would do them and then go over the results with him and then say, okay, we need copies of this. It sounds like a wonderful way to open yourself up to a world of information. We did, I did a lot of uh, repeat uh, presentations, a lot of classroom presentations and, um. and for the grad students and, and some of the undergrads too. So we did a lot of, and whenever I had a new database, I would also try to tell the search, the search analysts. Most, many cases, the searches say in, in um, the Hissey Library or in VET or in Life Science were more subject oriented because of the biological sciences. Whereas in my situation, I could run, I ran searches again almost every topic that you could possibly hmm. access. And you were the only one doing those kinds of searches. Until we, until we, as we picked up more vendors and then the people in the life science also picked that up too. I and see. so we, well, we would work together on that.
But the presentations, I think, helped a lot so that students knew that the service was available and then sometimes they would be willing to pay for it. It also was available to non-university users as well. And we right? had some people in the local community that knew about it and they would sometimes come over and talk to me about it so it was available. But our primary, our heavy users were the university faculty and staff. Okay. And then, um, do you recall how that transitioned from the dial-up kind of thing to the web-based products, like the internet? I think that came about as the library began to add, add their online catalog, and then from that, then, and also I think when the web became available, then some of the vendors are not being used as they could access it through the internet and through services like that it became available. So some of the vendors that we dealt with are no longer, that, or they've been sold or they're no longer in business. But some of the uh, workshops were extremely helpful uh, to give any of the new, and also Dialogue used to have an annual meeting. And I would go to that and a couple of times I took, uh, they had a regional meeting and I took Judy Nixon and we gave a presentation when the DVDs became available on some of the systems that we could get and loaded them on the equipment. And then one thing that you mentioned that really struck me is the transition to the online catalog. That must have been a really hectic year for the libraries when everybody was kind of learning a new way to find what they were looking for. Well, a little bit, but they had a, the precursor to that was our serials was the first thing that came up. And that was, we used to get a computer printout and they would get, they would be able to access it a little bit that way. But they had a lot of presentations and we had a lot of sessions down here in the, in the training room in the undergrad to show people how to do it. And then the, uh, all the people in the library became very well known to be able to help the users one on one. And we, the other thing that uh, the database ser service also provided, we ran a lot of current awareness searches. Uh, the, they would set up their profile and then I would run those or have them run at, ultimately at the National Library of Medicine, they would send me the printout and then I would send that on to the person. So we ran, and then when they'd have some specials, like when NLM had a, an anniversary, one day was a free day and I knew it was coming, I let everybody know they would send the request and I would get in here early and I think one day was the top, I, I must have run maybe 40 some odd searches. Whoa. But I had already run, I had worked out the strategy beforehand and I knew what their topics were and then we just ran them to the people. And we sent them in campus mail or they came to pick them up. But mm -hmm. the SDI service was heavily used and, was very, and very reasonable. Even some of our faculty used it too, which was nice. Were there any faculty who were reluctant to sort of um, take on the, the web-based searching? I don't think so. I think that uh, the, the user aids and things of that sort were readily available and they, they could transition, I think, easier because they had a little bit of a feel or how the files were put together and how they oh. could. The name of the game is selecting the right keywords mm -hmm. and you don't want to, and being able to be selective and not get a lot of, you know, references that are not very very uh, relevant but it was it was a very good and then but then as that as the uh, internet came and we had our own online catalog then the database searching moved from the vendors and then they also became available through the library networks and that's so that's what occurred okay. but it was it was a very heavily used searchers um, one of the things that we that and I had a lot of user manuals and I also ordered uh, user manuals for the other search analysts too. And I worked with them. Uh, very often they would call me and say, you, could you give me some key suggestions? So we worked together as a team. I also helped out at one time when um, the technical information service became available. And that is no longer available. But when that came up, they had an ad in the paper. And the next day they were simply inundated with requests. Hmm. And initially it was a free service because of the funding that they got to get it set up. So I had a call from the person who was ahead and the person said, could you help me out? So I said, okay, I will come over, pick up some of the requests and I'll run them and then give them to you. So wow. that's what we did. So it helped out a little bit. Can you describe what the technical information service the, That was a service, that, it's similar to TAP, but it was, it was to provide uh, database searching results to uh, industry and corporate, not, not, not Purdue. Mm -hmm. And they would also provide the documents as well. So when you got your printout, then you could give them a call. And also they provided document retrieval service too. Ah, so see. it was similar, but that's gone, it's, been, it's no longer in existence. 
Um, Sue Ward was the one that was in charge of that and some of the other people that worked on it. It was a very good service, very, very personable. And then, so in 1996, you went in a totally different direction as interim head of the Archives and Special right. Collections. How that came about was that Helen Schroyer, who'd been, the arch who'd been in the Archives and Special Collections for a number of years, retired. And the associate dean at that time asked me if I would be willing to be the interim head, and I said, yes, I would. So it happened to be located in 279, and, my, and that was a large room, and my office was in a corner and the archives occupied most of the space in this particular room. So I made an easy transition, so I just moved, moved across the way. I, did, I still did a few searches, but most of, the, most of the time it was really in the archives. And at that time, the uh, office also took care of the dissertation abstract, dissertation um, checking in and getting the, uh, for deposit. Ultimately, that moved back to the grad school, but I, used, I wasn't involved in that but I had two people that handled the thesis checking and deposit and working with the grad students on that. When I took it over, uh, one of the things I had to, that I spent a lot of time because, because of the anniversary was the Amelia Earhart collection. And it was very extensive and I really spent a lot of time on that and I worked with a company that published a book about the Amelia Earhart, sort of one of those coffee table books. And they came, they spent time, and they came here. And so I worked with them one-on-one. -on -one. It turned out to be very, you know, a very good book. Um, I also did a lot of exhibits. And one of the things that I did during that time, the President's Council uh, has that uh, pregame breakfast. And at that, for a number of years, I'm not sure whether they're doing it any longer, but they would have exhibits. The schools would put on exhibits of some of their things, like engineering would put something on, or agriculture. And the library participated, and I did that for a number of years. Uh, on, it used to be Saturday, because the games are always on Saturday, so it would be Saturday morning. And that was very good. One of the things that people always ask me to bring, I brought the first thesis, which is 1876, and had to do with the uh, uh, with brewery, with the with uh, beer, beer, the making of beer, which there was a beer company in Lafayette, and one time I forgot to bring it, and they said, "Why didn't you?" And I said, "Well, I just neglected." But uh, it was tied in because sometimes, one time we had a back to campus class up in the archives on Amelia when her anniversary of her birth, so the next day, uh, the exhibit had to do with some of the things with the uh, our Amelia Earhart, and they also did a lot of exhibits setting those up in the, uh, archives and in the Archives and Special Collections. We had four display cases, and we had a lot of, lot of walk-in traffic because being on the second floor were a lot of the conferences. When they'd have a break, they'd come through, come and look at it. So it kind of made people a little more aware of, wh of what the archives you know, was, all, was all about and what the collection had to do. Uh, a couple of the feature things I did, we have a lot of books dealing with Indiana. People even know, didn't even know about the Indiana collection, so I did several exhibits on that, and that worked out. Also, the limited editions; those are a special book where one of our alums uh, set that exhibit up and paid for the having of the books, and so I would do some exhibits on that. And he was a member of the the dean's advisory council, development council. Whenever they would have that, I would always be sure to have some of the things that that we could see on display at that time. Back to the Earhart collection, there's not a lot of people who've probably come in contact with those materials. So I was just wondering if you could describe what it was like to see them for the first time and maybe to hold her flight helmet or read some of her letters. You mean seeing all the materials and things? It was really very nice. And uh, I read some of the books that, that were in the collection. We have a very extensive collection. I think the highlight of that would be when, I, when the uh, Sally Putman Chapman gift came, and I was in, worked with the special events office to get everything, to get the display set up, and also a lot of the pictures and things of that sort, and, was, and worked with the program, uh, worked with the Elliott Hall of Music people who put together that video that had to do with Amelia, and all of the program was very, very nice, and that, it was a wonderful program. Also, it was held out in the hangar where she kept her plane, and uh, at, out at the airport that had a very, very good turnout of that. In fact, a little side thing on that, I'd taken the pictures and I'd had them all enlarged. 
And I had read in advance, since I knew that the wall was brick, it's an older building out there, obviously that hanger's been around a long time. So I wanted to be sure that what I was going to hang, the tape would hold. Well, the tape did not hold. So one of our people in auxiliary services said, let's try the back-to-back -back tape. And I said, okay, that's fine, so that held. But then I went into the hangar, and in the hangar they were setting up for the TV and all of that program, but they had a lot of black, the curtains that dropped to hide the equipment, and that's where I was going to hang the rest of the photographs. Well, the tape I had selected for cloth didn't seem to hold very well, okay? Well, there was some of the people that were there, and I went over and I said, do you have any of that electrician tape, the black tape? Do. So that was fine. All the pictures held. But just to be on the safe side, the day of the program, I went out there early in the morning, well, about after 8 o'clock, just to be sure that nothing had fallen down during the night and everything was great. <laughs> and people, a lot of the people that came really, really enjoyed seeing, the, seeing all the photographs. You know, it was really kind of nice. <clears throat> and uh, do you have a favorite item in the Earhart collection? Um, I think the uh, smelling salts, the, those green bottles are very nice, and I think the jacket is quite nice. The uh, Indiana Historical Society had an exhibit uh, during the time that was the interim head, and they had a special program, they had a speaker, and we loaned some of the, the, equip, the materials, including their clothing, and so we went down for the, pre, for the, they had a program for Purdue before the opening. It was really, it was quite nice. Somebody who'd been involved in some of the uh, explorations looking for her plane was the speaker, and he had a lot of slides and things. So it was, it was a good program. And they liked the, I think the, we had some children that used to come and they like to look at the goggles, where it's something that really caught their eye. And also, I think they, and they like the flight suit. They used to like to hold up the flight suit and think, oh, wow, this person was really tall. But all the, the clothing, I think, is, is nice, considering it's lasted this long. And then, um, then you became the Special Collections Librarian in 2005. Right. I, that's when, at that time, then, uh, <laughs> Sammy Morris was hired. She came in as the, as the acting head and then became head of the archives and I was the special collections. And I worked and I shared a lot of the materials with her and sort of told her a little bit about some of them. And then also uh, we were trying to, I uh, worked with one of the students that I hired to make a list of the faculty papers and some of the documents that uh, listings and that were a little bit out of date, so we started to work with those and becoming a little, we gave some presentations. Some of the people from Visual and Performing Arts would come over and we would talk a little bit about the book, so that, that worked out very nicely, I think. So still doing sort of instruction type right, things. Right, exactly. And then we also did some exhibits too. Uh, we, we did, when uh, homecoming, we always tried to do a football exhibit, and uh, one time they were doing the Joe Tiller show up in the archives, and so we had all of the exhibit there for the football players, and he came over because we started back in the late 1800s, and I had some of these older, and he said, my Lord, I didn't realize those were the kind of uniforms, so it was, kind of, it was sort of fun. The archives was pretty well, you know, special collections, a lot of people used, it was really nice. And in 2006, um, you became the oral history librarian, right, exactly. and you've, you've held that position until your retirement. Uh -huh. Um, Jim Mullins talked to me about that. He, I think he had a conversation, probably had some conversations with Sammy, who was the head of the archives, that it might be good to start that. And so he asked me if I would be willing to do it, and I said, yes, I would. So the first thing that we had to do was to be certified by the IRB. So both Sammy and I took that exam, which is a challenge. And then um, I relocated my office instead of being in Stewart 279. I was in 264, which was on the uh, same floor, but just a little bit, and that freed up some space in the archives and special collections. One of the first things that I thought we needed to do was probably work on a, a brochure or a handout. And then I, I touched base with the alumni office, and I also worked very closely with our development person, Judy Shoemaker, who was the development and advancement person at that time, because she might have some leads on people. The next thing I thought we also needed was an, an advisory committee. So I, I uh, contacted some people and uh, set up an advisory committee, and then we had our, I started there in probably May, and then in July we had our first meeting, including our former dean was on the advisory committee. And the advisory committee, some of them, most of them have been with me, been with the, the program the whole time, but they were extremely helpful in giving contacts and very receptive and gave very good 
um, suggestions and ideas. And we met, used to meet every six months, twice a year. And uh, as you interviewed so many people over not a huge span of time, did your perspective on giving oral histories change at all or your technique? I think you need, there's a lot of research that goes into that, uh, and, I very, and I think very fortunately, I use the Purdue file, the vertical file, but also many of the people give me their Vita, but you need, and of course the, the standard list of questions have been approved by uh, the IRB, and they have to do with your where when you were born and your education, but then I try to focus in on the particular area or specialty that the interviewee, of, whether he's an alum, and I've also interviewed students because that gives a flavor for the college, the years of college in 210, 211, and that, that's been very helpful. Um, but you need to have, and then I also can send the topics, I do send the topics in advance if they would like to see those. And then afterwards, they'll ultimately get a transcript before we load it on our website. That was another thing that we did, we set up our website too, um, shortly after the program got up and running. So the program has really blossomed since mm -hmm. since you be began it. Be beg pardon? Since you began it in 2006. It's really right. come it's a just long grown ways. a lot. And also I have interviewed um, many I the I do faculty, staff, students, alumni, uh, of course retirees including faculty, and then I've done some of the presidents. And this is the first time that we've been able to interview a president at the beginning of their term and I did President Cordova shortly after she started. And I've interviewed some of the administrators who have since left, and that has worked out very nicely. I, I sort of follow, I get leads from people, but if I find out that someone's leaving, then I try to touch base with them to see if they'd be willing to do an interview. Um, I can do either, most of them are audio, but I can also do email, which is very, which is nice, and I can also do a, um, I've done video, and I've done telephone. And particularly that cuts down on the travel. You know, so especially if you're dealing with retirees who are living in California or Nevada or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did you have an opportunity to travel as the oral history librarian? Uh, not, no, I didn't. I concentrated most of my efforts right here to get the system, keep it up and running. And I've been very helpful because we've had people, we have students that do the transcription and they've been extremely helpful. And then the person in the archives, the digital coordinator, also helps a lot with the uh, um, oral history program. And then, so you recently retired. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything planned for your retirement? Any well, I'm big sort projects? Of, uh, I'm sort of transitioning and uh, probably gonna, I'm going to stay in the community. I also, talking about retirement, I would like to say that uh, the dean and the library special events hosted a retirement event for me on June 30th, which was very nice. And I should, I was pleasantly and very much surprised to receive two awards presented by Sheila Klinker, our the state representative. One was a resolution from the House of Representatives of the Indiana Legislature signed by Pat Bauer and Sheila Klinker, and the other one was the Distinguished Hoosier Award, which is given by the Governor Mitch Daniels of Indiana, Junior of Indiana. So that was a big, big surprise, and it was very nice. A lot of the retirees came. We had a very, it was a, it was a wonderful reception. I really, appreci I really appreciated that. And also it was nice that there were people there that I had interviewed, and uh, that, that was really kind of special, that they were able to come to. So, um, for instance, one of them was Dr. and Mrs. Baring were there, um, Sonia and Sonia Margin and her husband Dale. Sonia used to be the mayor of West Lafayette at one time, and Dale Margin was in the chemistry department. And um, a couple of people from the vet school, like um, uh, Ken Meyer and his wife were there. So it was, it was, and Katie McMillan from the class of 1950, the building on the same thing. So it was, it was kind of nice to touch base with them. A wild party. <laughs> going a very out receptive a party. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was, it was nice. And I, I really, I really appreciate all the people that came, particularly the ones that I had, you know, been involved with over the years too. <clears throat> and can you talk about that, um, the Indiana General Assembly resolution, what is that? 
that's a resolution and in recognition of my 43 years of service to the university and to the library. And then the Hoosier one is also that recognition for the work that you have done. And, well, congratulations. Uh, they're nicely framed, yeah. too, and I have them. I think the other thing that was kind of nice at the reception, they had this large easel of various pictures of me through time, and then they had different quotes in there, including the, the football coach, which really surprised me, because they know that I do go to the games. So that, that made it kind of nice, I think. Yeah. And do you have any uh, memorable Purdue moment that really stands out to you that you would like to share? Uh, I think that... Um, I think when I got that award, the Moriarty Award was a very was very nice, and also the the recognition at the retirement, and also the opportunities that I've had over time, starting when my first came as a reference librarian, then I worked in the personnel, and also the bulk of the time being involved with the database searching, and which was new at that time, and being able to see it grow over time until the technology moved forward, and so did the databases move forward, and then I think that the oral history is a, is a, was a wonderful opportunity and it gave me a chance to interview many people. Some of them have since passed away since I've interviewed, but it's really nice. As somebody said to me, uh, the widow of one of the people said, it's really nice that you were able to interview my husband because having the transcript and knowing that his voice is there, our children and grandchildren really appreciate that. We have some interviews that were that were done a number of years ago, and we're hoping to be able to get those transcribed and digitized so that we can add. They're on the website, but they're not available at the moment. And you've seen a lot, a lot of change in your years at Purdue. And I'm wondering, um, to be to be in a career at the time that technology it just takes off. Um, I'm sure you've had to do a lot of adapting and, um, and, and that you've been through a lot of experiences. So I'm just wondering, is there anything that you would like to impart on younger librarians starting out where you were 40 some years ago? Mm, I think you have to keep up with the times. And I think that the people that are coming on board now are very knowledgeable because they come up through the schools that way. So they know a little bit about what the technology and what the, the they're, they're living in today's times and I think it makes it a lot easier. I also think that uh, being a faculty member was very good. I really enjoyed that and, and I had a lot of help, a lot of mentoring and you know up front about the promotion and tenure situation. But I think all the all the people in within the university, it's a wonderful community. And also the also the Lafayette and West Lafayette is too as well. And there's a lot of activities and, and there's just a lot there's a lot you can bring to it, and it brings to you, so it works, it equalizes. And I have, I have really enjoyed it very much. And is there anything that we didn't discuss that you want to talk about? Uh, I think we've pretty much covered it, unless, unless you thought of something that I haven't. I think that, that being able to share this, and also the part two, to kind of highlight some of the, the bulk of the things that I've done, particularly the oral history and the database searching, I think was, was very key, and I'm glad that we're able to do that. Um, and I hope that, and I think that uh, the, the oral history certainly will continue because I think it adds a great dimension. Uh, and I, the dean asked me to comment when he was commenting at the retirement, was there anybody that has refused? And I said, I don't think so, and I think that speaks and I think it helps, too, that uh, if you explain a little bit about what the program is, and sometimes it, I've also done, I'll go and talk to the people and tell them a little bit more about it rather than just do it by email, and that helps a lot. Because some people may have had some experiences and they weren't real sure, so if you do it one-on-one. -on -one. And the other thing that I've also done, too, you're always marketing this program. You have, because there's new people coming on board, and I have met with all of the deans would accept a couple of them to tell them a little bit about the program and also to keep in mind if there's some alumni or special people they'd like to have interviewed, I'll be glad to work with them, which, which has been very helpful. It's, port, it's an important way of preserving the history. Right, that's right, exactly. Okay, and is there any other topic that you wanted to return I, to? I think we've got pretty much covered, because you looked at the agenda from before. I think that I think that pretty well covers it. It's been really great, and I'm hoping to be around for a while. 
maybe to the year 2020. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to see. <laughs> well, thank you very much okay. for, thank for you. being thank interviewed Thank you very again. much. I appreciate that.